Here is the um, Pender Shot device with the basket coils and a couple of other things. It's hard to get it to oscillate in a manner that uh, gives you any output. In the winter of 1928, an inventor from Pennsylvania said he had done what experts thought was impossible. His name was Lester J. Hendershot. In a small workshop packed with coils, magnets, and copper wire, he claimed to build a machine that drew power from the Earth's magnetic field. Newspapers called it a fuel-less generator. Some writers suggested it might change the world. For a short time, many people wondered if a simple device had opened the door to endless energy. Hendershot was not a scientist by training. He was a self-taught engineer who loved radio circuits and followed the rise of aviation. He said the idea surfaced while he was studying aircraft compasses. He noticed strange interactions between coils and magnets when they sat in certain positions with respect to the planet's field. From that clue, he began to build a new kind of generator. It used no gasoline. It had no moving parts. It took no outside power. He described it as a magnetic resonance converter, a machine that harvested energy already around us rather than creating it. The first unit he showed was small. It was a tidy frame of wood and metal, wound with wire coils and joined to capacitors and a few transformers. Witnesses said it powered a small motor and lit light bulbs with ease. To those who watched, the effect felt thrilling and unsettling. Electricity poured from a device that seemed to consume nothing. Headlines soon followed, hinting at an invention that could make engines obsolete. America in the late 1920s was ready for wonders. Even then, a machine that made power from nowhere seemed to defy the foundations of physics. Hendershot spoke with calm conviction. He said he was not breaking any law of nature. He said he was using forces science did not yet fully understand. Later accounts in niche magazines and club newsletters added a famous name to the story. They said Charles A. Lindbergh showed interest in the device. Some stories claimed he watched a demonstration and even tested a motor tied to it, confirming that it ran without fuel. Whether those reports were true or not is still unclear, yet they gave the legend a powerful push. Soon, the Hendershot generator was whispered about in aircraft hangars and scientific clubs as a device that could change flight. Hendershot dreamed along those lines. He imagined airplanes that could fly without refueling, their motors fed by a silent source that never ran dry. Then the tone shifted. After the first burst of attention, curiosity gave way to secrecy and doubt. Military officers reportedly looked into his work. Men who said they spoke for powerful investors visited his shop. Some offered funding. Others spoke in careful warnings. Within months, Hendershot stopped public shows. He said he needed time to perfect the design. By the early 1930s, rumors spread that his lab had been searched and his notes taken. Skeptics said the machine was a trick built on hidden batteries or on induction from nearby lines. Supporters insisted that there was something real at the core, a delicate resonance between tuned coils and the geomagnetic field that could yield a low but steady output. Each retelling brought more debate. Facts blurred into hearsay. The arguments grew louder than the evidence. One thing seemed certain. The generator that had caused such excitement disappeared as quickly as it had appeared. For years afterward, scattered enthusiasts tried to rebuild it from diagrams said to be copied from his notebooks. Most failed, producing nothing but weak sparks. A few claimed success, yet offered no solid proof. The Hendershot generator became one of the field's haunting stories, an invention kept alive by rumor and by the memories of aging witnesses. In the 1950s, Hendershot stepped back into view. The nuclear age had begun, and the dream of vast, cheap energy was everywhere. He said he had improved his generator and began to build fresh prototypes. He showed a model that reportedly produced 50 to 100 watts, enough to light several bulbs without any fuel or input current. A few engineers who saw it admitted the unit behaved oddly, but could not explain how it worked. The press wrote about him again, and the quiet inventor found himself once more at the center of curiosity and dispute. Fame did not treat him kindly. 
Over time, he became nervous and suspicious. He told friends that people wanted his work suppressed and that certain agencies were watching him. He believed that a machine able to bypass fuel would never be welcomed by companies that sold energy. Whether those fears were justified or born of exhaustion remains a subject of debate. In February 1961, the story turned from mystery to tragedy. Lester Hendershot was found dead in his workshop in New Stanton, Pennsylvania. The official report stated that he had hanged himself with an electrical cord. The death was ruled a suicide and the case was closed. To those who knew him, the account felt incomplete. In the weeks before his death, he had been building yet another prototype and had sounded excited about new progress. Some said he had secured a possible deal to mass produce his generator. Others claimed he was preparing a press demonstration. None of that fit the picture of a man about to end his life. Rumors gathered at once. People said his workshop had been searched even before investigators arrived. Others claimed that papers and coils were missing and that his notebook was gone. Neighbors remembered unfamiliar visitors in unmarked cars days before the end. These details may be false memories, or they may be fragments of truth. They became the base of the mysterious death legend that still surrounds him. The lack of a thorough inquiry led many, including members of his family, to suspect foul play. Some believed that his work posed a threat to large energy companies. Stories circulated that he had been warned by a major corporation, which he refused to name, to stop his research. According to those stories, he accepted $25,000 on the condition that he halt work for 20 years. He told relatives that he feared for his safety. These claims have never been settled, yet they remain a part of the narrative that keeps interest alive. Skeptics answer with a simpler view. They argue that his death was a tragic suicide brought on by frustration, financial trouble, and the sting of ridicule from mainstream science. They point out that despite decades of claims, no working model ever reached an independent lab for a proper test. Engineers who reviewed the surviving drawings said the notes were incomplete and sometimes inconsistent. In their view, the verdict of science is clear. A free energy generator does not exist. Yet questions remain that keep the debate alive. Why did credible witnesses say they saw a machine run without fuel? Why did military officers and corporate engineers visit him if the device was only a hoax? Why were his most important notes and prototypes never recovered after his death? These gaps keep the idea of suppression alive. Those who believe in his discovery say he found a form of electromagnetic resonance not yet understood in his day. They compare it to what later inventors called zero-point energy. In that view, the machine did not create power from nothing. It harvested an existing flow, drawing on the steady magnetic environment of the Earth. It would not break conservation. It would tap a source that standard systems ignore. But without a verifiable working model, the claim stays in the realm of speculation. The most common diagrams linked to the generator are simple and puzzling at once. They show two large air core coils wound in opposite directions, each with metal cylinders inside that act as capacitors. Capacitors, transformers, and a permanent magnet link the coils into a closed loop. When the values are tuned just right, the system is supposed to oscillate. Through magnetic coupling, those oscillations are said to grow into a usable output. Modern experimenters often suggest that, at best, such a circuit might gather small currents from ambient radio noise and from tiny shifts in nearby fields. That is far below the levels Hendershot described. Even so, people keep trying. More than 90 years later, builders still trade blueprints on obscure websites and small forums. They argue over resonance methods and how to position the magnet. They seek a lost key that would make the circuit come alive. To this group, Hendershot is not a fraud. He is a pioneer cut off before his time. They say the cause of his end was not despair, but suppression. In that narrative, his fate echoes that of other controversial inventors. People link his name to Nikola Tesla and to Thomas Henry Murray. These men, it is said, built devices that did not fit common theories and faced sharp resistance. 
Discoveries that could unsettle the energy business meet intense pressure. Stories of sudden deaths and lost notebooks follow close behind. In late retellings of the case, one short line often appears. In it, Hendershot is said to have written that energy is everywhere if you know how to look. Today, his generator survives as digital blueprints that circle the internet, redrawn with modern parts and posted with new guesses. Enthusiasts keep experimenting, adjusting and listening, hoping to rediscover what he may have known. Did Lester J. Hendershot truly find a way to draw power from the Earth's magnetic field? Or was he a gifted dreamer, lost in his own invention? The answer lies somewhere between science and myth, between careful craft and hard limits. His machine may have been an elegant resonance circuit. It may have been something far more profound. What cannot be denied is that the mystery of his death keeps the legend alive. The hope carried in his design keeps people building, testing, and imagining. That quiet pull, felt across a century, is why his name still returns whenever people dare to ask whether free energy could be real.